Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Mike Remington, council member and mayor pro tem for city of Duval. I'd like to welcome everybody to our meeting. Uh, this evening, uh, we'll start with good of the order. Um, we have a, a closed session meeting uh, for collective bargaining that we'll move to. Uh, and then we'll come back to this Zoom meeting. I apologize ahead of time for some tapping that you hear in the background. Um, uh, I will ask council if we can move our financial report for 2020, October 2020 to the end of the meeting. That just preps us here so that if we go longer on budget, we can bump that uh, to, uh, to January uh, instead of this meeting. We want to maximize our time for budget discussion. Any concern with council if we move the first item on uh, financial reports to the end of the me uh, this meeting? I don't see any, so we'll move that. Uh, a majority of our discussion then will be uh, on budget, but we have uh, one other item on sewer capital improvement program uh, that uh, Director Linaszewski is, is moving forward. That's related to uh, parametrics and uh, we'll, we'll have about a 30 minute discussion on that. Um, well, I'd like to move to go to the order. Uh, I do have a couple of items. Uh, Jody, can I call on you first? Uh, we have a uh, council opening and I think you've got an update for us. Yep, I do. So good evening, Mayor and Council, Jody Wyckoff, City Clerk. Just giving you a quick update. Yesterday at noon was our deadline for applications for the open council seat. We received a total of seven. The applications are in your OneDrive folder, so you are welcome to peruse them and contact the applicants at your leisure. I will be sending a follow-up e email to all applicants either this evening or tomorrow to kind of give them a heads up on next steps. Um, and as long as council is amenable to it, then the next step will be January 5th. You will go into executive session to discuss qualifications and then come out and vote by matrix to reduce the number from seven to three. Then on your January 19th meeting, somehow virtually we will do public interviews and then you will go into executive session to discuss qualifications and then vote by matrix to appoint a new council member and that council member uh, will be sworn in that evening by Mayor Okalander. And, uh, then I'll onboard them and all the other stuff. So um, that is my update. Is there any questions? Ms. Hoag? So when we um, do the interviews during the council meeting, are we able to upgrade the them to like a panelist so that we can see their video? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So what I'll do is I'll do similar to what I've done in the past where when we, um, when we've had other staff members or outside consultants and such join the meeting as an attendee, I can promote them to a panelist. So yeah, you can see their video and everything. The part that I'm not sure how we're going to do is normally in a, a in-person setting, the two people that are not being interviewed would go into a separate room so that they don't have an unfair advantage because you normally ask the same questions of all applicants. So I just haven't quite figured out how I'm gonna do that. Um, I'm gonna work with the, the final three applicants and see if we can't figure out a way to maybe not have them in the meeting until it's their turn or something along those lines. So we'll figure that out as we get closer. Anybody else? Okay, that's it for me. Thank you, everyone. Um, I, I will let folks know, uh, Jody informed me we had one applicant who had turned in uh, their application two hours late. And she asked me um, what they should do with it. And I said, well, we do have a deadline. And I recommended that uh, we just inform that applicant that uh, they didn't meet the deadline, uh, which is what we did. Um, I always feel bad about that. I don't know who the applicant was, um, but uh, I just wanted to keep you updated uh, on that as well. Um, and I uh, always ache for a citizen that wants to join us or put their name in, but uh, either because of computer problems or other issues that didn't get in on time. Um, 
Mayor, thanks for joining us. Um, I, I wanted to ask, I, I was uh, reviewing all of the budget items and one of the things that popped up in my mind was, uh, you know, we're gonna be doing a contract city administrator. Uh, while the final budget hasn't been approved, it looked like everyone was supporting moving that forward. And I know it takes time, but I, Mayor, I wanted a request of, uh, of you and of our city attorney, if we couldn't get moving on that sooner than later, if you could bring something forward to council, I'd like to see something as early as sometime in January, if it's possible, in terms of being able to move that item and, and start the process. Uh, I think that's, uh, you know, the sooner we can get that uh, additional support uh, and help in place, uh, and uh, I, I thought maybe here, if I requested it, it might uh, uh, might make sure everybody's on board and, and we're ready to start that uh, sometime after the first of the year. Yep, absolutely. Um, that's one of the first tasks to start on on January 1st um, to move. And we have a timeline for how long it will take to get that person in place. Um, we have to update the job description for the half time and the specific tasks that we need to get done. Um, and we'll be contacting Prothman and potentially others to see if there's candidates available um, and may need to go out um, at large, depending on who's available on an interim basis. But yes, we plan to start that process in January and we'll bring, we'll bring it forward when it's ready. Great. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, if you hear a little pounding in the background, we are having carpet laid in the house and uh, rather than me be out in the cold or boot them out. So I apologize in advance for some of the noise in the background. Um, one additional question I had received from several council members, uh, Director Leniszewski had sent out his Friday update and that included some information that uh, the consultant uh, was uh, working on uh, early plans for uh, two of our road projects, which included Bruett Road. And, and we had agreed in the last um, C, CIP discussions to put that one on hold till we got information. Uh, and I, I spoke to uh, Steve today about that. And he said that they had planned uh, prior to, to our discussions, uh, having the consultant provide for both, um, is it to, Roney uh, Road, as well as Bruett, there are some cost savings in doing both. It's not getting uh, the overlay done, it's just getting some of the early work and it was uh, uh, deemed appropriate to, to try to do both at one time with the consultant to, to save some money. So that, that's, uh, that's what the feedback is um, uh, and I appreciated that, uh, but I wanted to check in with council. Uh, we're not moving forward with the overlay portion uh, until we get additional money or uh, information later. Uh, but I understand that there were concerns or questions about it. Um, so is there any additional feedback? It looks like we have a couple of council member Langle and then council member Naplin. Uh, yeah, my question is how was that consultant uh, selected? Were they selected through an RFQ process? And what is the estimated uh, design cost? Director Leniszewski, uh, is that something I can have you uh, uh, provide for us? Yeah. Uh, good evening, Steve Leniszewski, uh, Public Works Director. So uh, Mr. Remington misspoke a little. So the question was- That uh, happens from time to time, by the way. I know. Uh, are we going to overlay Roney and Bruett? So the answer, so the grant we received is for Roney section only. Uh, but I, I did advise in our conversation that we should consider designing both Roney and Bruett at the same time. Um, just it's an economy of scale. It will save some money on having one contract over two. We have not solicited that work yet as I do not have a budget to authorize any activities. So yeah, we would go out for an RFP for an engineer to provide that service. Assuming we get the uh, budget passed and moving forward. So, yep. Councilman Langle, uh, did that answer it for you? This yeah, I mean, I think it does. And I understand um, why you would want to do that. Um, I guess my question on Bruit would be um, really more one of, we had talked about holding back on that. It's, it's uh, individual, collectively, the two projects uh, are um, considered a major public works under the state law. Individually, they're not. Uh, they're in the next category down, as I recall, uh, you know, presuming you're considering them as a single trade. 
Am I right about that? They're considered a single trade in terms of the actual construction work or are they considered multi-craft? They probably could be, but I think it's just to have it considered multi. Because there's oh, a That's actually better uh, in terms of the collective projects um, and especially if they're not being done together. Um, so I guess um, I understand the economies of it. And since the contract is gonna come to council, I guess if there's other information we need, we can request it at that point, even if Bruett's actual construction does not occur at the same time. So I would say I can understand what he's trying to do and I, I'm fine with it. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Naplin. Thanks. I just wanted to mention that I was looking at the estimate for that and it includes reworking a couple uh, sidewalk um, landing areas, it looked like. And it just occurred to me, um, we were talking on at the ETP meeting how important it was for pedestrian safety. And um, I'm just, I'm thinking of the landing area by Judd Park. It feels a little narrow and I am I know we did everything according to what we have to do, but I don't, perhaps a larger landing area might be, appreciated by the community. And so I think there are gonna be quite a few areas maybe where you're kind of on a corner where cars might be turning and it'd be nice to be able to be away from the road a little bit while you're waiting to cross. I I mean, I, anyway, I just wanted to throw that out there before we designed it. I don't know if there's options or not. There's an awful lot of families that might have dogs, strollers like i'm just thinking of standing there at the corner with my dog on a leash and a stroller like i did for years and years and years that that would feel very chaotic literally being a foot away from traffic taking a right turn in front of me anyway i just wanted to throw that out there if there are options there um to give a little bit more landing space sure when we get into design we can consider that but i think it is a nice i think everybody can see that especially at 275 to 150th because now on the south side, you have a nice plaza and on the north side, you have an existing feature. So yeah, we talked about coming back after the fact too and, and kind of expanding behind there. So we'll have to see how it all works out with the new light poles and there's a lot of things in the way in that corner, but it can always be added as okay. plaza because yeah. it's not part of the travel way. It doesn't, you know, ADA compliance has been met. So anything else is just extra. Okay. I don't know if you've been there recently, but they put the light pole poles like right up next to it. So it'd probably be hard to make that any deeper at this point. So just for the future, I think our community would love to see a little bit larger areas to be waiting to cross. Anyway. I have it, I have it on record that Scope Creek is on, on Miss Naplin now, not me. No. I got it. Uh, council members, uh, any other items for good of the order? Council Member McHenry. Yeah, I just wanted to bring up the email that was sent to council from the veterinary hospital. Um, and so I was just curious if potentially we could hear more from uh, community development or in January about that item, about the codes. Director Thomas. I have to unmute myself. Sorry, apologies for that. Uh, yes, I will need a copy of that particular item that was sent to council. But yes, we're we're definitely aware of what their concerns are. I've talked to the mayor about it, and we're having an internal conversation. But I can definitely bring that back. It's one of our policies that requires improvements if you go over a certain threshold of redevelopment on your site, where you end up with you know curb gutter sidewalks and um, you know, other types of improvements that can that can be costly for redevelopment within our within our community. Okay, thanks. I forwarded yeah. it to you. Thank you. Other council members, good to the order. Not not seeing any. Uh, we would like to move now to our closed session with the attorney on collective bargaining. So if you'll look at your calendars and join that and to others that might be at this meeting, uh, we will be returning after we're done with our closed session. Thank you.
for the record, this is Jody Wyckoff, City Clerk. The actual time the collective bargaining closed session started was 4.50 p.m. It took a few minutes for them to switch over to the other meeting. I will update if it gets extended. For the record, this is Jody Wyckoff, City Clerk. The closed session has been extended five minutes. For the record, this is City Clerk Jody Wyckoff. The closed session has been extended an additional 10 minutes. For the record, this is Jody Wyckoff, City Clerk. The closed session has been extended an additional five minutes. For the record, this is Jody Wyckoff, City Clerk. The closed session has been extended an additional three minutes. For the record, this is Jody Wyckoff, City Clerk. The closed session has been extended an additional two minutes. For the record, this is Jody Wyckoff, City Clerk. The closed session has been extended an additional two minutes. For the record, this is Jody Wyckoff, City Clerk. The closed session has been extended an additional three minutes. For the record, this is Jody Wyckoff, City Clerk. The closed session has been extended an additional three minutes. For the record, this is Jody Wyckoff, City Clerk. The closed session has been extended an additional two minutes. Steve, I think we're ready to move on to our next item, which is the Sewer Capital Improvement Program, CIP. Uh, I believe that uh, Director Leniszewski is also with uh, Randy Raymond with Parametrics. Welcome, Randy. Thank you very much. Um, Steve, don't know if you wanted to say anything before we started? Uh, yeah, I would just introduce you. So uh, good evening, Mayor Council. and. And then check panelists or participants listening, uh, community attendees. Um, we were, are here to present the culmination of a long time, not necessarily in scope, but in time to coordinate and get everything done. Uh, the updated CIP list for the sewer program. And Parametrics has been providing that service. And Randy Raymond here is our lead. Uh, we have a, a PowerPoint. I think we had 30 minutes on the books. We actually don't think it will take that long, but you know, leave time for questions and answer and and some overviews. But I think with that said, we will just let Randy jump right into it. And I think we got what five slides, Randy, and a CIP list. So you you have any problems sharing? Let me know. I can I can bring it up. Everyone see that? All right. Yep. So you can see that? Okay. Right, yes, thanks. sir. All right, thank you, Mayor and Council members. Uh, as Steve said, I'm Randy Raymond with Parametrics. I'm the project manager for the uh, Wastewater System Evaluation and Planning Project. And we've been working with city staff for a little over two years to complete an analysis of the city's entire wastewater system. And that includes the gravity conveyance system, the pump stations, and the wastewater treatment plant. And the goal of that project is to generate a recommended list of improvement projects for your capital improvement plan and for rate and GFC studies. Um, so I just wanted to go through this. Sorry, get my slide to move. There we go. Um, wanted to go through very briefly uh, the components of the project. Um, we perform facility inspections and analysis of all of your facilities, the pump stations and the wastewater treatment plant. And in conjunction with that, we also did a capacity analysis of the treatment plant and an evaluation of your sewer outfall. Um, we also evaluated land use and future land use incorporating the current population growth. Uh, a lot of the previous planning was based on some older growth rates. And as you guys know, you've been growing pretty quickly and wanted to make sure we were 
um, looking at the most current information in that regard. Uh, we also conducted some conveyance of the gravity system. We did some modeling of that, um, not the entire system, but the main trunk lines. Again, just to make sure that we have adequate current and future capacity in the gravity collection system. And after doing all that, we uh, summarized what the deficiencies were and worked with staff to develop the projects and the programs to um, move this forward. And the last part of this, um, we also worked with subconsultant FCS group to assess the sewer rates and general facility charges. And uh, that portion of the discussion, I believe, will be at the January 5th meeting with FCS group. Um, and we mainly wanted to bring these projects to you tonight to help prepare you for that. Um, so in the next few slides, I'll go on through and describe each of the projects that we came up with briefly. And then at the end of that, I will uh, bring up a more detailed spreadsheet that talks about the costs and the schedule and so forth for each of these projects. Um, so the majority of the projects are related to the wastewater treatment plant. Um, the treatment plant was last upgraded in 2002 and we're coming up against both some equipment life issues and some um, uh, growth issues, essentially capacity. Um, so I'll just walk you through each of these projects very quickly. Uh, the first project is the UV system upgrade and that's your ultraviolet disinfection system. Again, that's nearing the end of its useful life. And so we'll be replacing the UV system, but also providing capacity at the same time for the impending upgrade so that you'll be both replacing the equipment and upgrading it for further capacity. Um, the next project number two is the generator. Um, again, nearing the end of its useful life potentially, but it, um, we always like to check those out very carefully. Your generator tends to run at a lower than its rated capacity, which isn't always very good for generators. So this would just be a very thorough load test, making sure there are any um, that we can correct any issues that are found there and make sure that will continue to operate as needed. Uh, project number three is a headworks improvement and capacity upgrade. So there's a component of that that helps uh, remove uh, fat soils and grease from the system. Um, there's a component to remove some grit and we'd also be replacing the screens at the headworks. And again, that would incorporate increased capacity for the future expansion of the plant. And number four is a sort of a site-wide project. When we did our evaluation of the plant, we found a number of issues, uh, just things that weren't up to current code as the codes change over the years and some various uh, maintenance and improvement items um, and lump those into a single project that will cover the whole plant site. Then continuing at the treatment plant, um, projects five and six are the major capacity improvement. So the Department of Ecology requires you when you reach 85% of your treatment capacity, um, you're required to start planning for an upgrade to, you know, to address the larger capacity. And our capacity analysis indicated that you guys would be doing that in roughly 2023 to 2024. And with the rapid growth, that's coming up fairly quickly. So uh, project number five is the detailed design work for that capacity upgrade that would get you to your ultimate build out capacity at the plant. And then project number six is the actual construction of that project. Um, it takes year and a half or so to design a project like that, and then probably another year to year and a half to build it. Um, so we broke that into two different pieces. Uh, project number seven is uh, anoxic tank foaming. So uh, you, largely because of fat soils and grease, you do have some foaming. Uh, if we aren't able to address that through the headworks improvements, we put a project in there that would allow us, there are some other things that you can do to reduce foaming in those tanks to improve the process. Um, project number eight is a plant-wide security project, and that's essentially uh, replacing and upgrading fencing and signing just to keep the, the site secure and safe. And then the last treatment plant project is a blower replacement. Uh, your treatment process requires a significant number of aeration blowers, and those are uh, very expensive to run. They use a lot of electricity. And so as we near the end of the service life for those, we put a project in there to look at 
not only replacing them for their service life, but also looking at more energy efficient means of, of providing the aeration. So that takes care of the treatment plant. And don't worry, only one more slide. I know this isn't the most exciting thing in the world. Um, the pump station projects. Um, so you currently have five pump stations throughout the city. Um, three of them are older, two of them are pretty much brand new. But as we looked at the three older ones, uh, again, we found some just electrical issues that were, because the codes have been updated, there have been some safety code updates, um, some general wear and tear generators um, that are nearing the end of their service life, things of that nature. And we felt it was best to lump all that into a single project rather than try and fix these things one at a time um, to put them all together, have one general con contractor do the work um, of course, put that out to bid, and um, that way you get the economy of scale of, of working on all the sites at once. Um, then for the conveyance system, so this is the gravity conveyance. Uh, the first project is an infiltration and inflow repair. Um, so infiltration and inflow, or I and I, that's water, clean water getting into your sewer system that you don't want, typically from either groundwater or rainwater inflow. Um, and this particular project, the city staff has already identified some areas where we need to make some repairs to address I&I &I, and project CS1 is to repair those items. Uh, project CS2 is the old town alleys so in this area. And again, that's um, just clearing and gaining maintenance or gaining access for maintenance to the existing sewer system in the alleys in the old town area. And then CS3, the last conveyance project is 145th Street in here. Um, when we did your capacity analysis for your conveyance system, you have, it, it looked really good. There was really only that one spot on 145th, which may need to be upsized for a, a short length uh, to meet your current and future growth needs. So that project is a few years out to go back and take a closer look and determine if we do need to replace that pipe. And then uh, last but certainly not least, the citywide programs. Um, so uh, we talked about the I and I repair. That's a specific project. The citywide program number one is an infiltration and inflow program. So that's essentially annually looking at different parts of your system, doing video inspection and so forth, and determining where infiltration and inflow might be occurring, and then setting aside some money each year. So that you have a pot to go out there and repair what needs repaired um, when the time comes. Uh, then project number two is just a general collection system repair and replacement. Uh, the core of your collection system was built back in the early 70s. So uh, you know, again, we're having some wear and tear out there. Some, uh, some of the pipes and manholes do wear out over time. And so that's an annual set aside um, to that's strictly based on the existing system and existing capacity to go out there and make repairs as necessary. Uh, project number three is a sewer plan update. Again, every similar to what we're doing right now, every six to seven years, it's a good idea to go back and um, take a look and plan. And that also uh, provides an avenue as new regulatory issues might come up um, as Department of Ecology uh, continues to uh, impose stronger standards uh, to keep the water clean. Uh, make sure you have the money set aside for planning to address those and to address any future upgrades to your system. And then the last one is a small annual set aside for sewer fam facility building maintenance. Just uh, smaller things that don't rise to the level of a, a capital project, such as um, re-roofing pump stations, painting buildings, um, replacing carpet in offices, small things like that. Um, just setting aside a pot of money for that. And so with that, I will uh, close out this presentation and sorry, I need to reshare re my screen. Everybody see the spreadsheet? Yes. Okay. Um, and Council members, I understand you will receive a copy of this uh, after the presentation um, and didn't want to go in, into it in really great detail, but 
Um, this is a list of the same projects that I just went through um, that includes the cost for each project. Uh, as part of this project, we have to determine whether it's a project is repair and replacement, meaning it's strictly part of the existing system, whether it's an upgrade, um, meaning you're improving capacity or replacing equipment, or it's a capacity expansion, um, meaning that it's serving future growth capacity. And that all folds into whether or not it falls into the rate structure or the facilities, uh, general facilities charges. And again, uh, FCS group in a future meeting will go through that in a little bit more detail. Um, but wanted to mainly point out the, the way it breaks out between current capacity and future capacity for the majority of these projects. Um, it's 65% current pro capacity and 35% future. And that's based on growth estimates for the city. And as the um, same or similar numbers that have been used in the other capital improvement plans over the last few years. So most of these projects break down 65% current capacity, 35% future. There are a few things um, that break out differently. And I won't go into the great detail of each one of those, but um, there, if it isn't 65-35, there's typically a reason for that. It's either all future or it's all current capacity or um, you know, but we, we can provide a defensible reason for, for why we did each of those which is important when we're doing the rates and GFCs. Um, so got all the treatment plant projects on one page, all the rest on another page. And with that, I, uh, if anybody has any questions or would like me to discuss anything any further, I'd be happy to do so. Randy, thank you. Um, before I open it up or, or call on others, I, I did have a question. Uh, we were right in the middle of budget, so this is handy to have this come forward. Uh, we will be taking a look at several of the uh, uh, CIP projects um, in January, so we'd move the budget forward but come back to get additional information before authorizing funding on some of these. I think we had already approved almost everything on the wastewater side that included the mobile pump unit, the blower repair replacement and a UV system replacement. I wanted to ask you why you were here and we had your expertise. One item we haven't approved yet was the inflow and infiltration repair for 615,000 was our estimate. Uh, I noticed that you had under conveyance improvements, the inflow and uh, infiltration uh, piece and you had it under CS1 and CP1. Uh, so I, I just wanted to ask, so uh, your expertise on how important it is to move that along quickly uh, and also um, uh, does it save on filtering? You mentioned that, you know, you don't want to be getting clean water coming in that you have to pay to put through our system. Uh, so, do, you know, in the long run, does it making those repairs sooner save us and, and keep us from reaching that 85% capacity uh, sooner than later? Yes, absolutely. Uh, so that project, there's kind of two different projects there. And the, the one that's currently identified, my understanding from staff is, you know, we've already identified areas where we, we do have significant I and I that needs to be addressed. And um, yeah, absolutely, you don't you don't want to be treating clean rainwater in your wastewater treatment plant. Um, in there's a peaking factor on your system that we have to determine when we're doing your conveyance modeling. And I don't remember exactly what it is, but it's uh, for your system, it's, it's on the order of uh, two and a half or so. And what that peaking factor is mostly made up of is, you know, there, there are certain peak times of day that you have higher flow when people are getting ready for work in the morning, when people are, um, you know, uh, doing dinner in, in the evening, things of that nature. But the vast majority of that peaking factor is often related to infiltration and inflow. Um, so, and I, I'm aware of plants that their plant flow increases by a factor of five during heavy, heavy rainfall. Um, and obviously that's, there's a lot of expense associated with that. Um, at times you can even overwhelm a treatment plant by having too much infiltration and inflow resulting in permit violations and so forth. Um, but and you don't have that bad of a problem, but you, you know, there is an issue that should be addressed, but it, uh, it's also important with regard to that capacity 
um, every bit of rainwater I and I that you can get out of your plant is that much more capacity available for sewage to address growth. And um, honestly, it, it's you're growing so fast, it it's not going to make a huge difference, but it's um, it's not insignificant either. So you know you could buy a few more years of capacity potentially with some largely successful I and I projects. I like uh, saving a couple of years. On there. Well, council members, uh, questions uh, for Randy. I don't see any specific. Oh, here we go. Uh, council member Naplin and then uh, council member Lankel. Just super quick. There were two I and I projects. So the first one were like the hot spots we know these are critical do them as quick as you can and then the other was more of an annual program to where you know each year kind of try to find another area that's problematic not quite raises to the level of the hot spots that we need to do right away is that am i explaining that or am i misunderstanding um th that's that's pretty close i think that the cs1 project the one that's actually going out to construct it that's um, I and I that's already been identified, so we we know it's there. Um, it it does you know it takes a fair amount of effort to identify where your I and I is coming from, and so that's annually you go out and you do video inspection and look for you know, broken pipes, bad joints in your pipe, um, areas where water might be flowing in. You might also do some smoke testing to see if you have storm drains tied in, and so the the progr programmatic project is more to fund that effort moving forward and it's certainly not to say there aren't other areas in your city that need um i and i improvements it's just you need to find them over time and then set aside the money to fix that i see so the ones we've identified right now are kind of what you would envision we would put into our two-year budget or you know do those for sure in the next two years correct yeah. okay. thanks so Randy, just so everybody understands, because uh, I don't think I fully understand it, uh, but the inflow and infiltration, this is groundwater uh, that's under some pressure, just it's underground and this usually has some head pressure on it. But we wind up with a crack in a pipe, a hole in a pipe, uh, a seam that isn't sealed, and that water actually gets forced into our pipes, flows into the plant, so we wind up treating basically clean groundwater. Is that is that a layman's way of looking at it? Yeah, so, so that, that was an excellent description of the infiltration component is it's typically groundwater coming into the pipes. The inflow component is um, like typically surface water or uh, storm drainage. Um, so for example, if you had a manhole at a low spot in a curb and you know they have a couple little vent holes in it, well, if, if you, know, you have a heavy rainstorm and you have a big puddle fill up there, that water is all going to run through those holes into your sewer. So that, that would be um, inflow. And also, um, you, know, you have a relatively new sewer system from the 70s in the grand scheme of things. Um, but uh, back then and prior to that, it was quite common to have people tie in their yard drains, their roof drains um, to the sanitary sewer system back before you had to do a great deal of treatment. It just made sense to put in one pipe and put everything there. And so that can be another common cause um, and there are people who might have an illicit connection. Um, you know, they built their house, they, uh, the pipe was there and that was an easy place to put the drain. Um, so there can be a number of different sources. So it's both the groundwater infiltrating into the pipe and then it's surface rainwater drainage um, and or roof drains and the like uh, being piped into the pipe or running in through manhole lids and, and such. And then Randy, just to, to boot on that, Speaking about the alley work in general, I've spoken to a couple council members. This is a big undertaking because it's what the surface of our alleys look like as we go, and especially in Old Town, a lot of the pipe network is in the alley, which is technically backyards in Old Town. So we have a lot of kind of leg work and prep work and you know community involvement to do before we really start making a major headway, in, especially in the Old Town corridor. Those alleys are pretty uh, interesting topic. So I think we had uh, Council Member Langle and then uh, Mayor Okerlander. Yeah, I mean, first of all, I'm really excited to, to have this document because I remember um, my first meeting with Steve and us walking through the plant and 
uh, it was pretty obvious uh, even then that um, we needed a much better assessment of our situation. Um, so I, I really appreciate the work. Um, but, and I, I specifically appreciate it because, you know, we've, we've, we hope to vote on a budget tonight and um, the, the way it's structured now is that we will get further evaluation opportunities here right after the first of the year. So it seems like this report then can be used to uh, look at the, the strategy in more detail. And then the other thing is we've talked about um, having you know, somebody that can do more financial analysis for us you know, on, on the big picture city financing so the timing of this is very good because that's something somebody can really help us um, figure out because some of this is very big numbers and uh, it's going to have a lot of impact on citizens. And so, you know, great that we're getting it now because it can feed into several projects that are going to happen between now and mid-year. But I mean, obviously, we're just getting this information, so we really need a chance to digest it. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Okerlander. Yeah, I just wanted to also kind of point out um, and, and kind of easier to understand terms as well is that fixing the INI means that our emergency management director will have to send fewer Facebook posts out asking people not to flush in a high water event. Um, we had that happen a couple times last year um, because we had such uh, fierce, strong storms so quickly. Um, and um, this will definitely, the INI part will reduce that significantly. Besides the cost, it's also uh, becomes kind of an emergency management issue if it's not addressed properly. So just wanted to point that out as well. Thank you, Mayor. I think most of us remember that day. And, uh, that was a tough day at the plant when you're, I don't know how many times our regular capacity, but I think we were at least doubling it. Um, Randy, I have a, a, a question while you're here. And, you know, I, I don't understand as much as I'd like about our wastewater treatment plant. Uh, you've identified uh, items for us to look at for our CIP, uh, areas we can make improvement, small things like roofing and, and uh, painting some of the sheds and some much larger projects. The question I wanted to ask you, you know, do you as a professional see a lot of big red flags or are these normal things that you would find in a system and uh, pointing out what we need to keep our eye on and plan for? Uh, or are there areas that, you know, we're, we're kind of in trouble and we need to keep our eye and, and really address something uh, immediately? What, what are your thoughts? What's your professional view? I think overall your, your plant is very well run and, and for its age, it's in good shape. Um, so I, I think overall you're in pretty good shape there. There are a few of those projects, the plant-wide electrical improvements. Again, we found some issues there that aren't up to current code that you know, we consider that a safety issue and that we'd want to address that pretty quickly and some similar safety issues around those pump stations. And so that's reflected in the timing of some of these projects um, you know, that, that we show those happening sooner than later. Um, but other than that, it, it's really the, the capacity issue is the elephant in the room. You know, that's 2023, 2024, right around the corner um, and just having that capacity upgrade. Um, when we did your previous uh, plant upgrade back in 2002, we, it was built when we converted the plant to a membrane bioreactor, there are uh, what we call treatment trains they're essentially parallel treatment processes uh, for the capacity. And at the time we constructed and equipped three treatment trains, but we uh, did the ecology design report and we designed the facility to add the fourth treatment train, which will get you to your full build out capacity. So as I mean, that obviously a fairly large price tag on that plant upgrade, but it's been planned for, for almost 20 years um, so the plant is you know, set up for that upgrade. And because of that, um, A, we've already have approval from Ecology um, to add that fourth train from back in 2002. And B, there'll be a lower construction cost because it's there, you know, we've built that into and planned for uh, that future project. 
So that'll. So for our citizens listening, um, Randy, we have one additional train available. That would be our full build out. You mentioned 2324. Uh, that's outside of this particular budget. But when do you start? When do you start planning? How long would it take us uh, uh, to uh, to get that process started so it's it's ready to go when it's needed? Yeah. So in this current spreadsheet, we have the the detailed design of the upgrade in that 2023-2024 timeframe. Um, again, it, it uh, this will be because we have accommodated that uh, future design. It's not quite as involved of a design process as it might be if you had to, you know, add significant tankage or what have you to your your plant. But you know, typically it, it's on the order of a year or so to do a design like that. There's a lot of detail that goes into that. You're working with the suppliers to size the equipment, um, that sort of thing. Um, and so we have the 2023-2024 timeframe for the design and then late 2024 to 2025 for the actual construction of that project. And again, that's assuming that we hit that 85% when we think we are and maybe we do by another year or so um, from I and I improvements. Um, but, you know, that's certainly something that's coming up in the next three or four years. Okay. Well, thank you, Randy. Uh, council members, are there any other questions for, for Randy? Well, Randy, I don't see any. Uh, would you be available? I know we're talking about starting a, a public works uh, council uh, committee and uh, they're going to be going over um, a lot of items that council identified we just need more information and, and work through this planning uh, are you available to, to come to one of those with an invite to uh, help educate and answer some more questions absolutely i'd be happy to help you out with that great well i sure appreciate it randy Steve? yep randy thanks for coming and uh, doing a great job for us and for the record this is a second council member with scope creek so thank you mr remington i appreciate <laughs> it. no and uh, Parametrics has a specific task on contract. They are also an on-call support service for us. So they are one of the few who does have a dual role as, as you know, we do need support. So Parametrics has treated the city well. And this has been a very collaborative issue because, you know, they know the business of the treatment plant. We know the business of the treatment plant and we've collaborated, you know, good, good thing we can have videos now, but it's, it has been a long project. We are happy to conclude it. Uh, shortly and we will have the next meeting we'll have um, Tagi with the FCS group to go over their rates and the GFCs and everything. So. Great well Randy thanks for joining us you're always welcome to stay on and listen to the rest of our, our uh, committee of the whole meeting but uh, you have a good night thank you. Thanks for having me and uh, happy holidays and have a good night. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Director Linaszewski thank you as well I appreciated the presentation and learning a little bit more. Um, Steve, did you have any more for us? I do not. Okay. But I think mean, mean Dana is on here somewhere. I'm looking for the screens rotate around. And I'm not quite sure why they go where they go when, but uh, we have been working with parametrics. Dana has been involved as we go through the finance portion of this. Um, I know people are concerned. So rates, a sneak peek, right? Rates are staying where they are with, I think, a estimated two and a half percent COLA adjustment annually, which we have a CPI increase already program. So I think uh, Tagi will share the health of that. And uh, I think the GFC is programmed to go up based on growth and some of those costs. So um, yeah, anyway, it's look forward to seeing year, year. Yep. Well, I see uh, our attorney, Daniel Kenny has joined us as well. Uh, so we're moving on to our next item which is our 2021 20, or 2021, 2022 biennial budget discussions. Uh, we've been working on this for a couple of months now uh, since Mayor Rokerlander presented our new budget book, uh, looking to the future. I was hopeful uh, that we could start, uh, Daniel, with you. Uh, council had some questions. Uh, you were kind enough to uh, answer those for us and provide them in writing uh, ahead of time. But specifically, uh, we had looked at budget notes and we're wondering what authority they had. Should they be an ordinance? 
uh, what kind of impact do they have in the in the budget and where should we locate them? Uh, could you both for uh, reminding council on your feedback as well as letting our citizens know uh, uh, how you answered those for us? I would be happy to. Can, can everybody hear me okay? Yes, sounds good. Great, perfect, always like to check. Um, well, um, Mayor Burton Remington asked me to uh, provide some feedback on a few questions. I think that's been passed along. Um, so as he said, I'll just do a quick summary right now of what I had put into that email. Um, so I'm uh, just refreshing, there it is. Um, so the first questions, um, can budget notes be approved by ordinance? Um, the answer to that is yes, they really should be. Um, there's an RCW that provides for further authority um, from council to uh, provide limits. Um, and so you would do that uh, per that RCW by ordinance. So that, that is how I'd recommend doing that. Um, I think you could choose to do that in a standalone ordinance or with the budget ordinance. Um, just so everybody, you know, the public um, finance director and all of us have kind of a consolidated location, I think probably it would make most sense to put it with the budget ordinance. It's by ordinance. It's all related to the budget. Um, so, so that is um, the answer to that one. So if there, I'll, I'll just stop, pause there for a second. Are there any questions on that specifically? Okay, that, that was pretty straightforward one. So if you have questions, let me know. Um, and then, um, so I think the next question was about the specific um, budget notes. And so I can go very quickly through the budget notes that were provided to me. Um, I'll, I'll pause very quickly on each one after I provide just very quick commentary to see if anybody has any comments. Um, I'll defer to your discussion. Um, I don't wanna, you know, if there's questions for me, great, but then I'm happy to take a step back if you wanna discuss about them. Um, so the first one was the building maintenance reserve. Um, I didn't have a comment on that. Um, I think that was fine. Um, so again, I have nothing particular to, to add to that discussion. So I'll, I'll leave that one alone. Um, number three, um, uh, my only comment on this one, the human services funding, is that you may need a budget amendment depending on how that you know, is done. Uh, if you're moving within a fund, you're fine. But if you're uh, diminishing a fund, you have to have a budget amendment. So just something to keep track of. But again, no real comment on the budget No, otherwise. Um, number four, the policy analyst. Um, as far as I was reading it, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, it really doesn't tie to anything into the budget. And so I do think that this is something that doesn't need to be a budget note. Um, instead, you just work with administration and council to, to, to do this as time goes by, but I don't think there's any need to make it a budget note. Um, and then number five, this is the one that uh, I had more comments on. So I'll just quickly run through this. Um, the, there was kind of two, two tiers to my comments. And I think um, the first one is just, just to make sure, and again, um, there's nothing written here except for one clause that makes me think this, but we just want to make sure that we're not using the budget and this budget note to um, change the CIP or the TIP. That's a separate process that's, that you're required to go through. And I don't think that that was the intention. There's just the one clause that says until city council authorizes the individual part projects in part or in whole. So we wouldn't want to use that as a tool to, to effectively remove project. And so in the proposed language that I uh, put at the bottom, again, just proposed for your consideration, um, that would be removed knowing that you can always go through the, the uh, six year plan. You can, you, can, you can work with those things and you know, uh, Steve and Laura and, and council can um, go through that you know, process, which is totally normal and, and uh, makes sense. So that, that was one comment. Um, and then uh, the additional information I think is fine. And I think that makes a lot of sense. We've clearly, or I've clearly heard from council the, the desire to have more information earlier in the process. I think that's fine. Um, again, I don't think it says it here. I just wanna emphasize that that shouldn't be used as a process to you know, dip, your, dip your hands into administration. I don't think it says that. 
Um, and I think the way that it's written was fine. Um, but there were two that did catch my eye. It's the project deliverables and um, it's the staffing for it. That really is up to the director to establish and, man and manage the deliverables and to staff projects appropriately and to manage staff. Um, so I would recommend removing those two because I think that that could be either interpreted or used to kind of trend on the wrong side of the line. But like I said, the idea of getting information early on in the process so that as staff is formulating a project and doing all of those things that, that are, you know, um, director, you know, responsibility and administration that you are informed. I think that makes sense. And I think, you know, um, this basically puts pen to paper what, with what I think there was some discussions earlier on in early fall, maybe late summer about just getting more into agenda bills and more information to you. So I think that's fine. So there, there's the two things um, about, you know, the kind of approval of a project later taking out and then the, the two things that looked a little bit more administrative to me. And so what I did then is I, I uh, put together, I, I tried to change as, as little as I could um, uh, into the, the sample that was uh, included in the bottom of the larger red area there with the project list that would be included below that. And my understanding from reading it is that the the categories, the five categories of projects with uh, a number of projects listed under each one, that's what this project note would apply to. So when that project is thought about, you know, this note should be, uh, you know, brought along with that project um, and, you know, the information and everything should be part of moving that project forward. And so that was my understanding and what I thought uh, about that. The final one was the um, uh, wastewater treatment plant office and garage remodel. Um, so, you know, again, I thought that was fine. I think it just, um, it, it kind of just said that it was, it was budgeted and we just want to, you know, be involved with it. So I, I thought that that was fine um, and didn't really have a, a whole lot of comments on that either. Um, I'll, I'll stop there. Does anybody have any questions for me? And then, of course, you'll have your process to, to go over all of this as a council. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, looks like Councilmember Langle and then Councilmember Neplin. Um, yeah, the way I read your uh, first, thanks for the edits. Um, the, the way I read some of your information, I just want to clarify what's within uh, our role. Um, request when we got our you know our budget book I, I want to go back to budget book in a second but um it, when we uh, were discussing these things um our current budget book that we had to make decisions in many cases you know in, especially with CIP we didn't have schedules we didn't have um a lot of detail sometimes it was just one or two numbers so to be sure that I'm understanding you know, requesting things like schedules, um, more, pre, you know, more detail on pre-development information, um, those kinds of things would be commensurate with uh, that subsequent review. Uh, I don't think anything, I didn't hear anything in the budget discussion, and I know in my own memo, nothing took out any projects. Uh, in fact, actually in my lower list, I said, you keep them in the CIP and you keep the proposed funding strategy because it sort of gives some more weight um, to a funder in particular that you've made that known as your strategy. So first part of that question is scheduling, more detail on pre-development, uh, those kinds of things. Those are all the places we should focus on it right after the first of the year. Am I understanding correctly? Um, I'm not saying we do it. I'm saying that's the information we request. Yes, I mean, I, yes, I, I think that uh, asking for that information is is perfectly fine. Okay. Um, knowing that the creation of that information and the carrying out of those plans and deliverables and everything falls with you know the administration with that director, right. um, and you wouldn't have a role to say that plan isn't in the right order or that staffing isn't correct. Yeah, and, and um, you know, the, the, the more information that is requested, um, the more time that is spent on those information requests and there has to be a balancing on getting the, the project done and answering those questions. And that I think everybody needs to be mindful of that um, with, uh, with staff. So, but yes, I think asking the question um, is, is perfectly fine. 
Okay. And then my follow my second question has to do with staff capacity. Um, and it relates specifically to um, making sure that they can produce appropriate information for us to continue to make decisions. Um, my expectation would be that if there was an issue with that, um, administration would come back to us with their thoughts about, if, if they were having trouble doing a project, my expectation would be that administration would come to us and say, hey, this isn't, we can't do all of this or whatever. You know, but that would come from administration. We wouldn't be judging so much. Uh, we would just be working with whatever. Um, but, you know, there, there's a, you know, a situation with development where rubber does meet the road. And if, you know, if, if you know, if I, my expectation would be if there's a problem on administration, if they're having difficulty with executing a schedule, they will come to us and tell us what they need. Um, and then council can discuss that with them and collaborate or you know, do whatever you can. Is in my understanding the way the process would work, the administration will come to us if there is a difficulty. So 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 the administration and the directors and the project managers are in charge of those projects. Yep. They staff them, they evaluate staff, they shift staff, they change deliverables, mm -hmm. they work with the contractors, they do all of that. Um, if they need something more that isn't budgeted for. Um, council would be the, the authority to budget an additional resource or more money for a project that wasn't originally budgeted. And that would be up to staff to, you know, make that assessment and make that request to you. Um, and it would be then your role to receive the request and, and, and consider the request from a budgetary standpoint or from a contract standpoint and make a decision on one of those two types of items. Okay, so, and then just to clarify one more point about that. So if, if projects come to council and they are repeatedly over budget, what does council do in those situations? Since we cannot, we can't, we don't get involved in the rest of that. I mean, our choice then is to either not approve projects, um, I guess, which seems kind of awful if you know you need something. I mean, the last presentation is a good example. If we have to have a, you know, new uh, TRAN here uh, with construction tar starting in 2024, um, you know, that's a big deal. And we really need to hear from administration uh, what else goes along with, uh, you know, really a great study we are gonna get a chance to look at. Um, so what do we do in those situations? I'm, I'm looking for guidance as a council member. You know, um, there's only so much money, right? And if projects come in 100% more than what is budgeted, and, and specifically, we have a lot of, I shouldn't say a lot, we have several estimates in our CIP that are like 2017. So there's a really good chance that, that we will need updates on those numbers and I wanna make sure that our public works uh, staff uh, have the resources to do that. Um, otherwise, we're gonna be in a really awkward place, all of us, where we need to deliver something, say on the sewer system, and you know, we've pre-committed other dollars or whatever. I mean, how do we resolve that? I mean, obviously collaboration, but how do we resolve that um, at the council level when we have those situations? Well, I mean, I, you know, what, what you just said is, is the biggest thing. It's collaboration and it, and it takes problem solving because, um, like you said, there's uh, in, in most situations fairly finite dollars that are available. And so it's going to mean, uh, you know, moving dollars around. Um, you know, I, I work with a lot of different cities that are working on a lot of different projects. And those numbers are always moving around. There's no way around that. I'm not public works, so I defer to Steve. But um, you know, th those numbers always move around, and it's it's a it's a it's a dance trying to figure out you know getting as good a numbers as you can from this phase because you're never going to have 
details in a, in a two-year budget. I mean, that's just not possible from, from my perspective. And so getting something that's good enough there so that you feel comfortable. But, you know, uh, if, if something gets bumped by two months, you might miss a, a window for getting good construction bids. And then all of a sudden, you know, your bid went up 40% or you go through a summer when asphalt and concrete goes through the roof or wood goes through. I mean, it, these things happen all, and we've seen them all this year, to be honest. And so um, these things happen. And so um, that's going to be on the administration, on those directors to, you know, figure out how to do that project, understand what it may mean for other projects and present, you know, present a request for additional funding that takes into account the practical ramifications to the budget. Um, that's as much, you know, um, administration pulling that together for, for you as it is for you to then consider and uh, approve or to deal with it. Um, and, you know, of course, every project won't be over, but there are situations where they will be. And, and it's just a matter of collaboration and finding, you know, a way to prioritize, you know, where that money is going to get spent. But, but you know, I, I'm going to be totally honest. Um, you know, that, that, that's a, um, a key question for, um, you know, Steve, probably mostly just because they're public works projects for Dana, working with the budget, finding ways to, to, to grab money from locations that we can use it and understanding what that means for, for other things. And that would be, you know, at the time type situations. There's no way to really know now, not that you're asking that, but. Okay, I'm sorry, I have to ask one more question then. You know, under the statute, there's a provision if something comes in over budget, um, the, the out for that in terms of not rebidding, because you really don't want to have to rebid in certain situations, particularly if you have a, a weather um, impacted development project. I mean, that's, that's like the worst in a lot of ways. So in those situations under the statute, if it's over a certain percentage, then you have to establish that there's additional funds available. Um, and, but obviously this, we're on a cash basis and we don't really, um, we don't really have a mechanism right now to, um, I mean, you don't have a way to accrue on your books, right? So you have to figure out another way to manually track when other funds are really available you, because otherwise you could get in a situation where you, you um have to release a certain amount of reserves to be within you know to be able to say funds are available and that's going to mean something else on the list can't get done so are you saying then when those circumstances occur and public works comes to us and says other funds are available and actually it's finance confirms that that it, that's the point at which we go back and look at our cip and um, with, with the recommendations from administration, we start to assess what else we can do. Is, 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 is that the way we would handle that situation? I mean, you know, I think you'd have to address it at the time. I mean, sure, you, you may yeah. have to go back and look at those lists. You, you, you might not. I mean, I, yeah. I don't think I could say right now what, what that step would look like. But, you know, if something is necessary and it comes in way over budget, you're problem solving. And that's everybody. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yep. No problem. Council Member Naplin. Thank you. I just wanted to say thank you for sending that email to us. It was very helpful. Um, I have one quick request since we're talking about budget notes. Is there any way we could get the draft we're talking about up on the screen? Because I, I, I only have a tiny screen, so I can't. It's difficult to flip back and forth. Are, are, um, you, speak, are you speaking of my email? Uh, well, I guess we're trying to craft what I, I, I like the suggestion you had. So if we could see a draft that includes those suggestions up on the screen so we could Dana, do you have do you, Dana? Do you have that document that you can pull up for us? I'm looking for it right now. So that if, we're, if we're planning to adopt it tonight, I think it'd be really helpful to know exactly what are we talking about. <laughs> um, As I recall, Daniel did uh, provide 
um, his recommended language. And that was, Dana, that was question five. If you're looking at that email uh, under capital improvement program, and it's and I, right after the, uh, the numbered items for the CIP that were not going to be um, immediately approved for funding until we had additional. And I think and Daniel has email, it in. Right? Right? Not, an not an attachment. Yes, it, it's an actual email. And he sent okay. that on Monday. I, I have okay. it here. I can put it up on the screen okay. if you'd like. I just was hoping we like, could get that integrated into yeah. a document that we plan or may end up adopting tonight just to have it ready so we aren't scrambling later. And as we're talking about it, we're talking about the same thing. My only uh, comment was on, it reminded me when you said something about the CIP list, is I do not believe the building project, uh, the facility project is on any CIP. And so in order to be eligible for REIT, I think it has to be added. So obviously we wouldn't want to start spending money on a project that's not eligible for the funding that we've lined up for it. And so I don't even know if that should just be mentioned that, you know, we will get that added as a right. cursor to spending money on that project because we want that's to make good, sure it's eligible. That's a good catch. Dana, can you touch basis with us real quickly here? Did I lose Dana? I don't see Dana on my oh, screen. I'm here. I'm here. Oh, I'm sorry. Hello. So Dana, uh, the, the, so and maybe that's for directors as well. Uh, so the question is about adding that to our CIP so it's eligible for the REIT and, and necessary funding. Uh, that makes sense to me. Is that something we can take care of? I think that was the plan, wasn't it, Steve, is to get mm -hmm. that added? Yep. Yeah, I think it was the plan and I, I have no doubt staff would do that, but I, but it is just one more thing that I think made us feel a little bit hesitant. We, we don't know a lot about this project, the scope, exactly what's going to be done and it hasn't been on a CIP. This is kind of a new thing that just came up. So um, I just want to make sure that gets checked off so that we're 100%. So, uh, Daniel, I just want to make sure we're being efficient here. Are we ready to pull up Daniel's screen? And I think the mayor has input as well. Uh, so, Jody, do we have screen share for our attorney? Uh, yes, I, I think I have screen share, and I, I think I think the request was to have them all compiled. And yeah, I, it should be an exhibit to the ordinance, isn't that what we were? Doing? I don't think it has. Daniel's notes. So I can pull up, I, I pulled his notes over into uh, a Word doc. Do you want me to bring that up? Yeah, because that would be the exhibit, I assume. Yeah, I just want to make sure we have a clean document for the exhibit that includes the recommendations, the new language, just so I know kind of what well, we're we go. As long as the rest of council feels comfortable, uh, you know, following. The recommendations. I, I just want to say that I do. I, I appreciated his recommendations. So, so I would just say that, you know, um, so we can delete um, the red comment on one. Um, and then that becomes two and then you can delete the red comment on two. And then the next one, which will become three, you know, I'll defer to council, but I didn't think there was a need for uh, a budget note for that one. Yes. Okay, so we could delete the whole thing. Yes. And then for, for, for this next one, on the next page on the right, the italicized indented paragraph uh, in red, that one, yeah, precisely, that would get swapped in for the block paragraph on three with the numbered list to continue and remain. And then um, then all of all of the red through number six, which becomes number four, goes away. Actually, all, all red at this point can go away. And that, and that's it. 
So Daniel, if we can go up and uh, Jennifer's other question was on item, uh, the current item three, it would be um, the explanation here. Uh, you made, it the, made the changes already uh, that incorporated your input. Uh, let's go ahead and read through that council. Um, Daniel, if you don't mind just reading that for us for the record as well. Uh, and then we can see if there's any additional questions or input from council on that paragraph. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to zoom in. Well, I'm going to read it on my side screen. <laughs> uh, per, per city council direction, the following capital improvement projects contained within the 2021-2022 budget are funded as identified by city council. It says but instead of by. Oh, sorry. <laughs> by city council. <laughs> Yeah, I was like, that doesn't make sense. Shall receive additional information prior to any project expenditures. The, pu the purpose of this action is to allow additional opportunity apart from the budget process to receive supplemental informa information regarding project scope of work, timelines, funding options, print grant awards, project deliverables, and have understanding that our city staff has the capacity to manage the additional workload. In addition, it is essential during the worldwide COVID-19 pandemic that City Council takes additional time to assess the stability of budget revenue sources during the 2021-2022 period and continues to monitor the budget in light of potential pandemic impacts on community needs and established city priorities. So questions, Council, either uh, comments or suggested uh, edits. Uh, Councilman Naplin. So mine was just on item four. It says that it's in the CIP, but it is not in the CIP. So um, it would need to be added. I, I mean, I, I we talk about the CIP, which are capital projects in the budget, but I think CIP are official items that are on our six year CIP that make it eligible for reading. So I, Steve, can you clarify maybe a better way we could write this to acknowledge that it's a capital project in the budget. It needs to officially be added to the CIP, potentially. If, please correct me if I'm confused. No, you're close. And this is typically more of the planner's uh, bailiwick here, but I think. So maybe removing CIP from the first sentence. And if you wanted to be specific, you could flip that second sentence to have this, you know, project will be added to the six year CIP first and, and then, and we'll provide additional information on their model to the council. Just kind of flip those two. I think that might make people happier that, and it's kind of in order, it's logical. Let's do so the administration, floor. okay, so this, uh, so we'll say administration, well, technically, council has to approve adding it to the six-year CIP. So, no, to, you know, administration will present to council. To yeah, see. present to council for approval to be added to. Yeah, whatever. However, anyway, that was the only thing. It's super nit nitpicky. I didn't mean to, but I was worried it it wasn't quite accurate. And I think too for that to be and. Daniel's here, which is great. This is a little bit of a chicken and an egg where, you know, more information is wanted and, and needed, but yet if we don't put it on a list, we can't really expend any resources on it, even to preliminarily ferret it out. So I would say we, you know, overall we put something on the CIP and then come back to begin the process. And if we need to spell that out, you know, through the agenda item or whatever it is, that's reasonable. But I think we, we might get caught in a chicken and egg, which I don't think we want, but I don't know all the time. I think that really helped clarify it. Uh, other questions and input, uh, council member, or I'm sorry, Mayor Okerlander. Thank you, Mayor Partem. Um, and these are good notes, but I do want to, for the public's perspective as well, remind the public that 
um, that all of these projects, these budget notes um, really is reinforcing existing procedure um, because especially with all projects over $25,000, they all go through council through multiple touches. And to Director Leniszewski's point, the uh, wastewater treatment plant office and garage remodel um, is a new thing. So funds have not been expended to identify scope of that project. And the professionals haven't come in to tell us exactly what the space needs and what the, the cost is. Um, so we've had to do estimates based on the best information that we have. Um, but again, all of these projects, whether they've been approved in the capital um, improvement plan or through the budget process, if it goes over our spending authority or requires contracting um, that has to be approved by council, which is pretty much everything on the list, it all comes through um, public process. So this is, you know, really reaffirming what's existing when we're constantly trying to get more information out to council. Um, I would like to note and thank Dana and all of the department directors on the budget book. That is something that most jurisdictions don't have to even look at during the budget process. Um, most cities adopt their budget on a fund level and don't dig into the details the way this city does. So, um, you know, this is just want to just make that clear. These are good notes. It's a good reminder. Um, but it, and it does show the public that you're doing this, but I also want to remind the public that this is really for the most part, reiterating existing processes. Thank you, mayor, uh, input from council members, uh, council member Lingle. I don't have any more input on these, but I, I did want to ask a question about a budget note just to see where what people, whether they thought it needed a budget note. I'm thinking it doesn't, but I just thought I should bring it up. Is this the appropriate time? Sure. Absolutely. Um, okay, so one of the things that we funded is, is the facility study, and we, we, up, we increased the amount of money for it. And one of the things that I'm concerned about with a facility study, and we didn't really ever talk about this, has to do with we have some sites that might have environmental issues. And the sooner we know that as part of a facility study, the better. And this is something I actually talked to our public works director about quite some time ago um, with the garage facility there off Main Street. Um, there, there could really be some challenges uh, possibly around contamination um, due to things that have nothing to do with the city. And so I don't know that this needs a budget note, but I think it goes into the budget discussion is asking um, whether we have sufficient funds as part of the facility study um, to make sure at least a level one, possibly some soil testing is part of that facility study uh, amount of 50,000. I guess that's, uh, I'd like to hear uh, from our director on that. And then I guess just one other little thing, I guess it is about, well, no, it doesn't matter. I think our other notes are just fine. I'm really excited about the budget book. I just think it's so awesome. It's gonna be mentioned in the ordinance because it needs to be honored officially as part of our, our uh, administration's work. So I had previously mentioned that to, uh, our community development director, Laura Thomas, and I, I'm just, I'm just gushing about it. I think it's great. I love detail. We all know that. So, so uh, I recall many conversations. I don't recall any specific to this property and any sort of remediation investigation. And to be clear, the intent currently would not be to expand the footprint. So there would, there would be no subterranean excavation even thought about this time, not that it couldn't happen and not that we can't check our sites for other, um, you know, including this one for other issues. I say this one as I'm sitting in it. Um, so I guess that's that we can choose to spend the money right any way we want. If we want to have that work done, all, all for the, for the masses to you know, guide. Um, but yeah, we don't technically need it if we're not technically subterranean excavating we're not we wouldn't go outside the footprint that's that's a proposal i talked about staying inside the inside the shell we have I well think that, can i just add, yeah. follow up with that then sure. is that um is that as i understand the facility study it's going to be a first step towards something fairly comprehensive and whether we ever do anything on that site or not it could figure into 
this bigger plan as far as something like liquidating it for redevelopment, community development purposes, and in which case it gets, you know, it gets understood as it's going, um, and we we don't have any hindrances to um, to that removal from our future inventory. So I, I sort of see this when in that site in particular, I don't care so much about the other sites, but that site, because you have, you know, trucks in there, you've got other kinds of things that can be contaminants that affect if it's to be sold, for example. And you would want to know that if you uh, think that that's something that we would no longer be using and it would get liquidated as part of a facility study. That's why I'm bringing it up. And what I've seen, in fact, I've got a situation, a project I'm involved with right now, is that you really need to know that as part of any kind of sale or reuse, and the sooner you know it, the better. Um, that's why, and, you know, if the administration doesn't want to do it, that's up to them, I guess. But to me, it's a real risk. Um, and I'd like to, to know that if we do a facility study uh, that is comprehensive, but we don't have that scope of work, right? So that's why I'm bringing this up now. I think it's a good point. I, I really think that's something that uh, I feel bad that we hadn't got our public works committee, council committee up and running because those are the kind of key points that you do take a look at. Uh, council member Hogue. So with those kind of issues, it's a buyer's obligation to test for anything on properties. It's their obligation as part of an inspection period or a feasibility study to inspect all of that. A seller's not obligated to do that. So I wouldn't recommend doing that kind of, unless we were gonna add on to the property, but to do it to sell, I, I wouldn't recommend. Yeah. I have seen it done when, uh, not for selling, but really when you're working on a major project and you're, as Steve mentioned, you get into the soils, you know, sometimes I've had projects myself at firehouses and you discover things that require a, a fair amount of monies to uh, remediate. So it, it does fit in. And I think we'll have time uh, uh, to, to take a look at that, both with our facility study as, as well as uh, any other projects we, we work at. Uh, 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 just trying to wrap up on budget notes. Uh, Councilmember Lankel, uh, did you have? Oh, a I was just. I, I, I just want to say that with commercial property, my concern is that we assume it's worth a million dollars, and I, I mean I've got a remediation on a large piece of property right now that was simply a garage, and it is affected, um, has affected the transaction. Uh, because of state ecology requirements, well in excess of a half a million. And obviously that's a different environment, but it, it's just so we don't overestimate uh, what we potentially can get. And I, I, so I don't know if the facility study is gonna go that far. And I'm not suggesting this is a budget note. It's really more, I'm hoping we have enough money in the facility study if we need to do something like that to assess value in a sale. Thank you. Uh, I want to tie back in here. We're just a little bit from going to our, our council meeting. Uh, Danielle, I wanted to say thank you again for the budget notes. Uh, I really, having drafted some of these, appreciate your put, bringing your expertise. I think the language changes were not just appropriate, but uh, makes it a more effective budget note clarification and keeps our toes out of maybe some things we don't want to get into. So, so thank you for that. Uh, I want to tie back with council. Uh, we have our budget notes. Um, we had a chance to uh, take a look at those changes. Uh, I just want to make sure, are there any additional changes or does council have additional budget notes they feel need to be added at this point? Um, this is setting us up, of course, uh, at the very end of our council meeting, we'll be uh, have an opportunity to vote to uh, approve our 2021-2022 uh, budget. Uh, we're not going to resolve a bunch right here. We will have an opportunity at council if we need to have more discussion. I'm just trying to get an idea of how to frame further discussion. So any changes in the budget notes folks want to propose? 
I don't see any. Uh, any additions to the budget notes at this point? And I don't see any on that. Well, I, uh, City Clerk Wyckoff. Good evening, Jody Wyckoff, City Clerk. I just wanted to make a mention real quick. Um, Dana and I just discovered that the latest draft of the ordinance that is in the packet somehow we lost in translation between meeting dates the section four of the um, ordinance itself that actually calls out the budget notes as an exhibit um, so we are going to have to amend the ordinance tonight um, and daniel i was just going to ask um, since it was presented to council in the packet without it we will have to do an, a formal amendment motion is that correct yes okay so um, when the time comes, uh, we will be asking council to make an amendment to the motion to add a section for, um, to add the budget notes as exhibit A. Um, and we can walk you through that process when the time comes. Jody, can you have that so we can put it up on the screen during the meeting and highlight it, please? Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then Daniel, you were gonna say something. Yeah, just at the same time, you can, uh... Uh, put what the budget notes are so that it's clear that this language is being added to the ordinance and what it's doing is bringing in these budget notes. And then that way, when it's approved uh, with those changes, then it'll be uh, good to go and super excited for you guys to approve your budget tonight. So do you want us to read the budget notes into the record? Is that what you're thinking we should do? Um, I think you could probably just put them on the screen just to make sure that oh. everybody knows and then it'll be part of the packet and it'll be a part of part of the approved ordinance. You just want to make sure that the public has an understanding of what it is. Um, um, now that I say that out loud, there are people that are on the phone. Um, it, it, it might be wise. It, 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 it might take two or three minutes, but for, for the because that's the minimum level of participation under the OPMA right now, it might be wise to just do a quick read on them uh, to adopt them in. Okay. Sorry. No, that's okay. I just want to make sure we got our procedural steps all in order. Great. Well, council, that really concludes a lot of what we're doing here. Uh, I, yes, uh, Director Mason, did you have a input? I'm sorry, I thought I saw your hand up. Oh, I'm sorry, I interrupted. I. I added Jody, if you want to take a look at the ordinance, just to make sure I got it right. Uh, we've got time. You want to bring it up real quick? You want to do it here or are you? Okay, let's do it here. We're at 652. So I just added this section right here, section three. Sorry. It looks very short and precise. Yeah, I think that's the one we had in there before, so. Uh, Council Member Langle. Um, I, I, this is just a question. So what happens to the budget book as part of the ordinance? Or is it just, it just brief floats? I mean, it seems to me that's the whole basis of the budget when the final budget book is issued. How did, did that somehow have to be part of this or is it a budget note or, I mean, it, 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 should be in, it just seems like we don't want to lose it as part of the official tie to the ordinance. Yeah. You know, the, typically the ordinances are put in the budget book at the end of the process. So once that budget, uh, that ordinance is approved, um, that should be included in the budget book, which includes the exhibits. But, but that would mean that the, that, I mean, I'm not understanding, I guess, because what that would mean, are you saying that what we are adopting is the budget book? Because, and, and no, that, no, well, you're adopting, you're adopting the budget, but this is an, an, an exhibit, an addendum that ends up in the book. Yeah, I understand. The ordinance, the ordinance is the budget. What I'm asking is, I'll let me just phrase it as a question. Is the budget book officially part of the ordinance itself? That's a different. Oh. No, I do not believe so. So, do we want it to be? Can, can I speak to that real quick? Yes, uh, uh, Mr. Kenny. Yeah. Um, so, 
it, it's 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 actually kind of an interesting question. So, <clears throat> the RCW about budget adoption allows for the ordinance adopting the budget to set forth the summary totals, and that's what you've got here, and that's the process. And then it says a complete copy of the final budget as adopted shall be transmitted transmitted to the auditor and AWC. So, so it, it's, it's kind of a matter of semantics. The budget ordinance adopts the budget through summary tables, but the complete final budget as adopted is actually the larger document. So what you're adopting through ordinance is just those summary tables of the document itself. So, Daniel, you feel confident that the budget notes that we have in there are appropriately uh, placed to have the authority of the ordinance? For the budget notes, yes. Yes. Okay. But I was uh, asking about the budget book, not the notes. Yeah. So what, what, what happens to the budget book? I'm not worried about the notes. I think those are fine. So, Daniel, um, we have a full line item budget. And Dana, isn't that what's submitted to AWC in the state? That's a really good question. Um, I think it's just the ordinance that's submitted. I don't think it's the, the full budget book. I mean, as far as the budget book itself, I plan on. Well, I think so it's different. The line item budget is different than the budget book because the budget books what has all the narrative. The budget mm -hmm. book tells the story. The line item budget says what the expenditures are and the revenues are. So there are two, well, there's, there's that, three things. Yeah, there's the ordinance, there's the final budget, and then there's the budget book. The right. final or the, the ordinance and the final budget are the approved budgets for the city. The budget book is a narrative that is a tool that is used along with it. So it's not, um, it's not by ordinance, the budget book, um, the, the budget and the ordinance with the two tables is what, what you have. So I think if there's additional questions, we'll ask those on our last item under unfinished business in the budget. But it's a very important question. Like I say, it's intriguing as well. Uh, make sure we get that right. Well, it is 6.56. And if there's no other input at this point, I will adjourn our committee of the whole and we will move shortly to our city council meeting. Thank you, everyone.